The views expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect the views of the station, its employees, or ownership. Hello everyone, welcome to the Word from the Lord. James over here with you. Uh, so glad that you are with us. Hope you're ready for a study from God's Word. Here's our contact information. We always want to make sure that is up so that you can know how to reach us. We are not some of these individuals that run and hide. Uh, if you want to uh, study with us or visit with us, here's how you reach us. 250 the Boulevard in Eden, 27288. Uh, and uh, we have Bible studies on Sundays and, and uh, Thursdays, Thursday nights at 7 o'clock, Sundays at 10 and 11. 276-340-2653 is how you can reach me. A word from the Lord at gmail.com. That's my email address. And uh, you can also find us uh, pretty much any way that you, uh, you're you looking for us, you can find us. Um, the Church of Christ brings you these programs. What does the Bible say? A word from the Lord, religious view. These are all brought to you by the Church of Christ. And uh, as you'll notice, we never ask for money, so we hope that you recognize that we are trying to help the, help the community uh, we're trying to uh, uh, better the community. We're not taking money out. We don't have begathons and things like that that go on on uh, uh, different TV broadcasts or different religious groups beg for money. We don't do that because we want to give you what we have. We don't want you to give to us. And we hope that you recognize that. Uh, I think Chris Knott said one time that uh, uh, Johnny Robertson spent, uh, I think it was a quarter million dollars uh, given to this station, uh, which is, you know, I don't know where he got that figure, but it would be nice if we had a quarter million dollars, but I would say if that were the case, it just goes to show that we're putting money back in the, into the uh, economy, not taking it out. So uh, we hope that you recognize that. 823 Starling Avenue in Martinsville is where you can meet with the Saints there in Martinsville. 120 American Legion in Danville is where you can meet with the Saints there in Danville. You'll re be uh, warmly welcome. You'll be a guest, and we hope that you will uh, certainly uh, make yourself available uh, uh, to these brethren, to these assemblies, and, and uh, come and examine the Church of Christ. Um, of course, what does the Bible say? You just watched it. Uh, Word of the Lord is now. And then tonight at 10.30 after the news, we have a special religious review uh, that's going, coming up, and I, I'll probably stick around and say a little bit about that uh, as, we, as we get going. But we're... You know, some of us are involved, some of our brethren are involved in a tent meeting that's going on up in Michigan, Ludington, Michigan. And what we're, what we're doing, uh, folks, is we're actually uh, expanding the borders of the kingdom. Uh, brethren are fired up. They realize that, you know, all the, the denominational preachers in this area have simply demonstrated that they're cowards that they don't want to answer questions. They don't want to be examined. They, they want to just, you know, go and hide in their offices or hide in their buildings. They want to uh, not get in the spotlight. And what that's done is that's encouraged members of the Lord's Church to uh, uh, realize, you know what, not only do we have the truth, but the enemies, the ministers of the devil, the, 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 the local pastors and preachers and bishops and rabbis and whoever, they're, they're cowards too. And so it's not just in uh, Martinsville, Henry County. It's not just in Pennsylvania County. It's not just in Rockingham County. It's not just in this area of Virginia, North Carolina. It's also in Michigan. And I say it's everywhere else too. So what we're doing is we're actually uh, showing more the communities in different areas that you know what false teachers run because they don't have the truth if you have the truth you don't run and so uh, I think we've dem been demonstrating that really for the, about the past what 12 or 16 years and uh, you know that's pretty much been the uh, been the case we're still here the preachers that have come on they have Gone the way of the dinosaur, you know, they've kind of faded out uh, in the past. You don't see them coming back home. Don't see them coming back for more, even though they claim to have the truth. You know why? It's because the truth shines the light on the errors that people are teaching. And, folks, the, your friends in the Church of Christ, we have the truth. We're trying to give it to you, and we're trying to show it to you so that you can make religious reviews. You can look at what's going on in religion and say, you know what, that is not what's right 
according to the Bible. And so uh, I say we're helping the community, and we're helping the community up in Michigan do the same thing. A lot of, lot of things going on, a lot of good things going on in Michigan, and we're going to show you some of that tonight on Religious Review. And so just to help you see that, uh, yes, it is not just here. The Church of Christ is putting the devil on notice, and we are going to take a, a hold of false doctrine and tear it down. And so that's, that's our job. That's our goal is to eliminate false doctrine that is damning men's souls and sending them to the devil's hell. And so we want, to, uh, uh, want you to see that it's taking place in other areas as well. Speaking of false doctrine, we have been offering a $1,000 award for biblical authority for a number of things that people believe, commonly believe, like denominationalism. People say one church just gives another, finding the Bible. We say there's only one kind of church you can find in the Bible, and no one has proven otherwise. Yes, it may be called by different names. Oh, it's the Church of God. Well, you know what? The Church of God and the Church of Christ in the Bible are the same kind of church. Not the Church of God denomination like Jackie Poe talking about. Not the Church of God denomination that you find headquarters in Cleveland, Tennessee. Not these Church of, church of God that have the, the pew jumping and the, and the, and the begathons on TV. That's not the Church of God like you find in the Bible. That Church of God belongs to God the Son, the Christ, and that's why it's called the Church of Christ. That's the kind you find in the Bible. We're trying to look for, we're wanting people to examine the Bibles and find biblical authority. Now, we've had uh, some individuals that try to uh, uh, claim the reward. But here's the thing, friends. When you claim the reward, you have to know for certain that what you say is not going to contradict the Bible anywhere else. It's like this. If I have a little dog, and I say, you know what, I've lost my dog, and here's a description of the dog. He's got one ear up and one ear down. He's, he's yellow and black, and he's all fuzzy. And, uh, you know, he's got a, a, a real short tail. Then if, I'm, if you want to claim that reward for finding my lost dog, you're going to have to describe that dog perfectly before I'm ever going to say, you found my dog. You're going to have to show me that the dog you have is the dog that I'm looking for. And otherwise, you won't, get the, you won't get the reward. So what these people have done, they've actually tried to find something in the Bible that resembles what they believe, and then they want us to buy the idea that that's, that's what uh, uh, the Bible's talking about. Oh, no, because we'll find in the Bible other places where it contradicts and say, you know what, that's not what the Bible talks about. And what we've been looking at here lately is a letter that a man has sent us, Mr. Ernest D. Hopkins from Stewart, Virginia. And he's written this three-page letter trying to uh, prove that, uh, that the Bible, uh, uh, that what we're teaching from the Bible is false and that his version of truth is actually right. Now, he's been trying to, to say that baptism has no part in a man's salvation. The Bible says differently, but he says it doesn't. And he's been using different ways to describe that. Now, I want you to notice something else that he writes here. Let's just get right into it. I think this is on like the third page of his letter. And he's talking about Noah in 1 Peter 3.21. We're going to put that up uh, in just a moment. But let's read what he says he says. He says, if Noah was the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save, you, uh, save us, you can, you can see that Noah was not saved for heaven, which is eternal salvation, but rather he was saved with time salvation, which is here, uh, which is here in time. The baptism that doth now save us separates us from the world or the unbelievers just as Noah was separated from unbelievers in his generation. Well, what he realized, what he's not realizing, friends, is Noah's being saved by water was a figure of baptism that now saves us. See, it's not salvation for the same purpose as Noah, but it was a figure. That's what the Bible is saying. Notice, let's just go to 1 Peter. Uh, excuse me, 1 Peter, chapter 3, verse 20. Let's look at verse 20 here. Now notice this. Uh, I guess I need to get it over there where you can see it. How about that? 
1 Peter 3, verse 20. Now notice this. Here Peter's talking about Noah in the ark. All right? When once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is eight, souls were saved by water. Now, the type of salvation is not being spoken of here when it comes regard to Noah, but it is the manner or the method in which they were saved, saved by water. The like figure whereunto even baptism, there's water baptism, there's, there's the, the connection with water, doth also now save us. Now, Mr. Hopkins, you can't say that this is not talking about soul salvation. We know Noah wasn't saved uh, spiritually by the water, but the like figure whereby he was saved by water is the same, is, is now being put to baptism, doth also now save us. Not to put away the filth of flesh, it's not the physical washing of the, of, of the, of the body, but it's the answer of a good conduct toward God. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, friends, how in the world are you going to be saved by baptism when it comes to being connected with the resurrection of Christ? Well, let's just look at this. Let's just look at, uh, in Romans. Sorry about this. Let's see here. I'll get here in a minute. Romans chapter 6 and verse 3. Paul says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Where therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now notice, verse 5, If we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Now, how is it, how is it that you want to say that baptism has nothing to do with salvation when Peter says the like figure whereunto baptism doth also now save us by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and then Paul says in Romans 6 that we are planted in baptism and from baptism, from the grave of baptism, where we're buried with him, we are risen with him in his resurrection. Now, how in the world are you buried and resurrected just by faith only? Friends, there's no burial and resurrection in faith only, but there is a death, burial, and resurrection in connection with the waters of baptism. See? So, Mr. Hopkins... He wants us to believe, he wants us to believe that Noah, because Noah wasn't saved eternally or his soul salvation wasn't uh, in question there, then we shouldn't talk about soul salvation when it comes to the waters of baptism today. Mr. Hopkins. No, not at all. Tisk, tisk. You do err not knowing the scripture, my friend. You do err not knowing the scripture. Now, I want you to consider something else Mr. Hopkins said found this very interesting. As we come on down in this paragraph, notice this. He says, he says, the last line, uh, the comparing, right here, the last line, comparing 1 Peter 3.21 to Acts 2.38 is a deceitful way of teaching. Now, he says it's deceitful to compare Acts 2.38 and 1 Peter 3.21. Now, what I find is interesting is not so much that he doesn't like to put those two together. I know he doesn't like to put those two together. But what I found interesting is this. You may recall last week in Mr. Hopkins' letter, this is what he wrote. He says, Acts 2.38, Peter tried to bring an Old Testament practice or ordinance into the New Testament period. And he says, you're doing the same thing. Then he says, Jesus said that Peter didn't savor the thing of God. And then he said that Jesus called Peter Satan. Why follow Satan? What I want to know is why Mr. Hopkins is even concerned about 1 Peter 3.21. First, Mr. Hopkins says, don't follow Peter. Peter is Satan. 
And now he wants to defend Peter. Now he wants to say, well, Peter wasn't telling that. Well, why, why should I believe what you say about Peter? I thought Peter was the devil. I thought Peter was lying. Mr. Hopkins, Mr. Hopkins, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Now, either Peter was the devil, and you shouldn't even be messing with 1 Peter 3.21, or Peter wasn't the devil, and then, if he wasn't, why don't you take what he says in Acts 2.38? Now, which is it, Mr. P Mr. Hopkins? Which is it? See what we're doing, friends? Here's a man who wants a thousand dollars for this foolishness. He'd have he might he might come uh, uh, a little closer if he had a little better arguments, but he's so double-minded, so twisted up that he can't even know, he doesn't even know whether to defend Peter or not to defend Peter. Mr. Hopkins, I, I really hope that this is helping you. Now, if Peter was the devil and we don't want to listen to him in, first, in Acts two thirty-eight, then. You don't, need to talk, you don't need to start quoting 1 Peter 3.21. And if Peter was wrong about baptism in Acts 2.38, then, you know, maybe it does go together with 1 Peter 3.21. Maybe Peter missed it on both places. Why don't you just say that? At least that would be more consistent. But the sad thing is, or the truth of the matter is, though, Mr. Hopkins, is Peter is teaching the same thing. Baptism is connected with the remission of sins. Now, I didn't say water salvation or water only. I just said that it's connected with remission of sins. It is just as much connected with remission of sins as believing and repentance and confession is connected to salvation. In fact, but the problem is y'all you just don't want you just don't want water. You hydrophobic. You like Mr. Mr. Ralph Law, the hydrophobic. Scared of the water. You know, you got the rabies going here. I don't know. So anyway, so here we are. So Mr. Hopkins is double-minded. Now, let's go on and look at what else he says. Now, I found this very interesting. Now he's going to try to claim a reward when it comes to eternal salvation, eternal redemption, eternal life, as he says. Now, listen to his letter. He says... Uh, we're going to start right here in uh, Hebrews 9.12. Hebrews 9.12, by his own blood, he entered once into the holy place, being, having obtained eternal redemption. Now, he says Jesus entered into the holy place, and in doing so, he obtained eternal redemption. Now, let's put the verse up here. Hebrews 9, verse 12. All right, he got it right. Uh, by his own blood, he entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. All right, he obtained eternal redemption. Now, here is what Mr. Uh, uh, Hopkins does wrong, friends. You see, it's called a non sequitur when you say, here's the evidence, and then you have a conclusion that has nothing connected to it. Listen. Just because Jesus entered into the holy place and obtained eternal redemption does not mean that you are going to be eternally redeemed just because he did it. See? Just because he did something doesn't mean that you automatically get to participate in it and that you can never lose it. He says, if you have eternal redemption, you cannot lose it. It is eternal. Well, friends, what you need to stop and ask yourself is, what is eternal? The redemption, or is it eternal that you have it? See, there's two differences. There's two differences. There's a difference between you having eternal redemption eternally and redemption being eternal. Let me say it this way. <clears throat> you go down to the store. So you go to O'Reilly's, AutoZone, somewhere, and you buy a battery and it has a lifetime warranty on it. Now, you may have a lifetime warranty on that battery, but does that mean that you have a lifetime warranty? Does that mean that you are guaranteed for a lifetime? Or does it mean that you are guaranteed, you have a guarantee on the battery? See that? 
Now, if I buy a battery that has a lifetime warranty on it, and let's say I put it on my car, and then I sell my car to Brother Mark. Now, do I still have that lifetime warranty on that battery? No. But the battery still has a lifetime warranty on it. See, the warranty, the lifetime warranty, is talking about the battery. It's not talking about what I have. Me having that battery has nothing to do with whether it is a lifetime warranty or not. You see that? So just because eternal life or just because eternity is connected to redemption or eternity is connected to life, that does not mean that you have it. It means that it is for eternity. That doesn't, that doesn't conclude that you're going to have it for eternity. Because just like this battery, I can have a lifetime warranty of this battery, and somebody steals my battery, guess what? I've lost my lifetime warranty on my battery. See that? Now, let me put it another way. For some of you ladies out there, <clears throat> you say, well, I, I can't understand batteries. <clears throat> well, maybe you can understand coupons. Big, big thing going on now. I know a lot of people out there are clipping coupons, and they're doing extreme couponing, whatever. Now, what if you have a coupon that has no expiration date on it? You have a coupon there that says for a dollar off, two dollars off. You have a coupon that says 50 cent off. You have a coupon that says whatever, and it's good because it doesn't have an expiration date on it. Now, it is an eternal coupon. See that? You can get 50 cents off your cereal. You know, you can go get, you know, you can go get your uh, 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 free cake mix or you can go get whatever, you know, you want to get there. I don't know what, what you get coupons for. But you can go and you can use that coupon anytime because it has no expiration date. It's eternal, if you will. And as long as you have it, you can say, you know what? This is good. It's good. I've got an everlasting coupon. But friend, the minute that someone takes that coupon or the minute you give it to your neighbor, you no longer have the coupon. But you know what? It's still an everlasting coupon. It's still a non-expiration date coupon. You just don't have it anymore. You see, friends, now when we're talking about life, eternal life, that modifies salvation. That modifies redemption. That talks about life. That's not talking about you're a guarantee that you get it. And furthermore, friends, look at this. In Titus 1, verse 2, in Titus 1, uh, let's see here. Let me just do this again. Titus 1, in verse 2. <clears throat> well, I'll get it here in a minute. Titus 1. Maybe I'll get it. Here we go. Paul says, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Now look, eternal life is what has been promised. Now friends, God cannot lie. He'll keep his promise. But that doesn't mean that you can't do something to lose what God has promised. I tell my daughter, I say, you know what? You have phone privileges as long as you obey. I promise you, you can use your phone as long as you obey us. But guess what? I promised it, and I promise she can use her phone for eternity, if you will. But the minute she disobeys and breaks the rules, breaks the conditions, guess what she doesn't get? 
she doesn't get phone privileges. So, has I, have I broken my promise? No. I don't know. I broke my promise. See, the promise modified, modified what she could have, and it was contingent upon her keeping the conditions. So is God's promise. God cannot lie. He said, I'm going to promise eternal salvation. I'm going to promise eternal salvation. All right? Now, can you do something so that he will retract that? Yes. And has he broken his promise if, if he does that? No. And furthermore, notice this. In Titus chapter 3, verse 7, Titus 3, 7, Paul says, being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs to, according to the hope of eternal life. Now here again, life is, is called eternal. It has nothing to do with you having it, friends. It does not guarantee that you have it just because it is called eternal, number one. And number two, notice it is the hope of eternal life. Look, it's the hope of eternal life. Friends, hope is something in the future. You don't have eternal life right now. If you have eternal life right now, you're not going to die. You won't die. If you have eternal life right now, you will not die. And that's why... That's why when God, uh, when man sinned, he drove them out of the garden. Uh, when, God, when, when man sinned, God drove them out of the garden because he knew that they could have eternal life. Notice what he says in, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 22. And the Lord said, Behold, the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. You don't have eternal life right now, friends. Even if you are a child of God, you don't have eternal life because eternal life is in the future. It's in the hope of eternal life. Now you may have the hope of eternal life. But you don't have eternal life right now. Watch this. In Romans chapter 8, verse 24, this is what Paul says. He says, For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? If you got it in your hand, why do you hope for it? Why does Paul talk about the hope of eternal salvation if you've already got it right here, right now? He says, but we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. You say you have eternal life right now. Paul said you've got to wait for it. If you have the hope of something, then you have to wait for it, friends. You don't have eternal life right now. And you don't even have the hope of eternal life if you're not a member of the, of the Lord's church. Now, Mr. Hopkins, I, I'm sorry that uh, you're not getting your $1,000. But the problem is your doctrine just does not line up with what the Bible says. See? Just because life in Christ is called eternal or just because God promises eternal life doesn't mean you have it right now and it certainly doesn't mean that you can't lose it. Not in this lifetime. Now, Let's, let's look again. Now, the whole point of Mr. Hopkins writing this letter, I think, was also to send us a DVD. Now, he sent this DVD of a man named Mr. Dr. Robert Morey, and he is trying to show the doctrinal errors of the Church of Christ. And I guess that Dr. Morey is supposed to be Mr. Hopkins' hero. But Mr. Hopkins' hero actually hurt Mr. Hopkins' heresy. Say that five times real fast. All right? Hopkins' hero hurts Hopkins' heresy because Hopkins' hero doesn't agree with Hopkins. Remember, Mr. Hopkins says you do nothing for your salvation. You don't do anything. 
You, you, don't, you don't repent, you don't believe, God does all that for you. You don't do. It's, it's nothing. It's a do-nothing religion. It's what Mr. Hopkins teaches. Listen to what Dr. Uh, Robert Morey says. Well, then what is, what is Hebrews talking about? It says, He will give eternal salvation to those who obey Him. Well, you see, points of obedience or things to do. That's what commandments mean. What does it mean uh, to obey? It means the things to do, things to obey. There are those things which are addressed to people while they are in an unbelieving, an unrepentant state that you tell an unbeliever to do. Then there are those things after salvation which you tell a repentant believer to do. So that if you take the commands found in the New Testament you can have a chart and you can simply split the two and at the top you could say before salvation these are the things you must do in order to be saved. Now once you're saved here's another list of things you must do so that the commands of the New Testament and the New Covenant those things which Jesus encourages us and commands us to both be and do can be divided into two, two things, two columns. What unbelievers must do and what believers must do. Now, now Mr. Hopkins, I, I think you need to watch these videos before you start sending them out to try to support your, your position, your doctrine. Now, this guy, he, that's, that's not something we would say. The Bible tells the alien sinner things that you must do in order to be saved. Then there are things you must do in order to remain saved. Now, he didn't say remain saved, but there are things you must do after you're saved. Now, the difference that I would have with Mr. Mori here is he would say baptism is on the side of after you're saved, and I'm going to say the Bible shows clearly that baptism is on the side of what to do before you're saved. But he is still saying you have to do something. Now, Mr. Hopkins, maybe you need to send a, a DVD and a letter to Mr. Maury because he said you have to do something. You said you don't do anything. Now, which is it? Are you really wanting this man to be your champion? Is he really going to be your, your champion? Now, let's listen to this. Now, Hopkins says do something. Uh, Hopkins says do nothing. Maury says do something. For example, there is no controversy over the fact that God tells unrepentant sinners to do what? Repent! For they repent. Acts 17. Now, Mr. Hopkins says you can't repent. Mr. Maury says God tells you to repent, to do something. Mr. Hopkins says, no, you can't repent. God has to do it for you. Okay, well, Mr. Hopkins, your, your champion, your hero, is, uh, he, he's, mm, he's not on your side on this. Now, are people ever commanded to believe? Yes, they're told to believe. Well, you see, if you repent, that is obedience to a command which tells you to repent. If you believe, that's because you were told to believe. All right, now, again, Hopkins says do nothing. Maury says do something. Uh, Mr. Hopkins, this man's not helping you. Are you wanting to me to agree with this guy or disagree with him? Are you wanting him to convince me that I'm wrong? So far, you're not doing a very good job of it. So far, I'm, I'm doing pretty good agreeing with him on these points, that you have to do something that God commands you to repent. That's something you do. I think I said that. I said that before I ever heard of Dr. Morey. I, heard, I said that before you ever sent me the DVD, Mr. Hopkins. And then Mr. Morey says, belief is something you do. I think that's what we've been saying. All the people that say, well, you know, you believe in work salvation, we say, look, faith is a work. Faith is something you do. So which is it? Do you do something or do nothing? So far, this man's not convincing me of anything that you say. 
And just to make it a little clearer, <clears throat> listen to what Mr. Morey says. Now, I find it very interesting what he says on this point. Listen to this. And you see, false religion always gives little things for people to do in order for them to be saved because it makes salvation easy. All right, you hear that? Let's play it one more time. And you see, false religion always gives little things for people to do in order for them to be saved because it makes salvation easy. False religion? And you see, false religion always gives little things for people to do in order for them to be saved because it makes salvation easy. False religions get people to do something, little something for people to do because it's easy? Now, friends, does that strike you as, as interesting? What are some little things that false religions get people to do? Now, I know he would say, well, being baptized is one of them, friends. Being baptized is not a little thing. Little, uh, being baptized is not a little thing that you get someone to do. Because being baptized is something that most people don't want to do because it is so humiliating. It is a, a great step of, of, of uh, humility to be baptized. How about the little things, Dr. Morey, like just say, the, just say the sinner's prayer. Now, that sounds pretty easy to me. How about just pray through? That sounds pretty easy to me. How about just believe? That sounds pretty easy to me. How about just sit in your pew and say, Oh, I believe in Jesus. I got saved. That sounds pretty easy to me. But he says false religions get people to do little things because it's so easy. And yet here he is. They just got through saying, You got to do something. You got to do something. Well, is he part of a false religion? I say he is, because he's got one of those be saved in a very easy way doctrines. And then Mr. Hopkins comes along and says this. Mr. Hopkins says, do nothing. Well, if doing something, if doing something is easy, Mr. Hopkins, is doing nothing hard? I mean, here's a guy that, well, doing nothing sure is hard, but I'm not trying. I'll tell you what, I wish there's more people in our society that would do nothing if it's so hard. Wish they'd get up and, you know, be more productive so that they're not milking off all the rest of society. But friends, false religions tell you to do something little because it's easy? I would say, you know, uh, uh, saying the sinner's prayer or getting on the mourner's bench. Those are the easy things. Come forward and kneel down at the altar and let me lay my hands on you and beat your head to death. That sounds pretty easy to me. That's the little things that the false religions do. The Bible says for salvation you have to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. John 8, 24. The Bible says you must repent or you'll likewise perish, Luke 13, 3. The Bible says you must confess Christ before man, Romans 10, uh, uh, Romans 10, 9 and 10. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. And then the Bible says you must be baptized for the remission of sins, Acts 2, 38, Matthew, uh, Acts 22, 16. Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling them the Lord. Now that's that's a little harder than just saying a little prayer. That's a little harder than simply saying, well, you know, I'm sitting in my pew and who I believe. But it must not be near as easy as Mr. Hopkins' do-nothing religion. You know, you can do this hard religion laying on your couch. God's going to save you. Do nothing. Well, sorry, Mr. Hopkins. Uh, that's just a little too... Too easy for me to do nothing is a little too easy. Now, uh, as we pointed out, Mr. Morey is very contradictory here. On one, on one hand, he says, do something. And the other hand, he says, do uh, 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 false religion to say do something. 
And you see, false religion always gives little things for people to do in order for them to be saved because it makes salvation easy. Well, then, what is, what is Hebrews talking about? It says, he will give eternal salvation to those who obey him. Well, you see, points of obedience or things to do. That's what commandments mean. What does it mean uh, to obey? It means the things to do, things to obey. And you see, false religion always gives little things for people to do in order for them to be saved because it makes salvation easy. There are those th things which are addressed to people while they are in an unbelieving and unrepentant state that you tell an unbeliever to do. And you see, false religion always gives little things for people to do in order for them to be saved because it makes salvation easy. And you see, false religion always gives little things for people to do in order for them to be saved because it makes salvation easy. So that if you take the commands found in the New Testament, you can have a chart and you can simply up. split the two and at the top you Please. could say before salvation, these are the things you must do in order to be saved. Now, and you see, false religion always gives little things for people to do in order for them to be saved because it makes salvation easy. Now, see the double talk? Mr. Moore is really not too much different from Mr. Hopkins. Mr. Hopkins says do nothing. Mr. Moore says do something, but don't really do anything. Now, what I'm showing you, friends, is both of these guys are teaching false doctrine. Mr. Moore doesn't want to do what God says. Mr. Hopkins doesn't want to do what God says. And so in that regard, they're both in the same boat. But even Mr. Moore is disagreeing with Mr. Hopkins. And you know why? It's because both of their doctrines do not line up with the Bible. Both of their doctrines contradict what the Bible says in other places. And that's why we're here. We're here to help you see the hypocrisy, the confusion, the twisting, so that you then can look for yourself and say, you know what? This has to be the truth because it doesn't contradict somewhere. It doesn't contradict somewhere. But I want to show you, uh, I, I'm going to go on and, let's, and talk about some things that uh, people say in order to try to get around doing what the Bible says, especially in regard to salvation, especially in regard to baptism being for the remission of sins. Now, one of the things that Mr. Maury is going to say is he's going to bring up Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. As we saw before in Acts chapter 10, <coughs> verses 44 through 48, we notice the events very, very carefully. We're told in Acts that Cornelius was not saved. Yes, he was a, Jew, a Gentile proselyte to Judaism. Yes, he did many good deeds and he feared God, but the angel told Peter to go and preach to him in order that he might be saved. He was not saved just because he was a good Joe. Now, remember that. Notice then remember that. that the gospel was preached, as you look toward the end, verse 44, Remember that. He says, Cornelius wasn't saved just because he was a good Joe. Peter was preaching. Number two, Cornelius was listening to the Word of God. For faith comes by what? Hearing. Hearing of the Word of God, actually the better Greek rendering, the Word of Christ. He hears the Word, and while Peter is preaching, he believes. He steps over the line and says yes to Jesus Christ. It happens all the time in preaching. It's one of my great joys. If I didn't believe that could happen, I'd give up. But I've had people saved sitting in the audience. 
and come up after her and says, I think God has saved me. I said, hallelujah. Now, stop there for a minute, friends. Let's look at what the Bible says in regard to the account of Peter, because I know we're running out of time. Uh, <clears throat> in Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 10, I want you to notice something about Cornelius. Yes, Cornelius was lost. Peter says in Acts chapter 11 and verse 14, sorry about that, Acts chapter 11 and verse 14, that Peter was going to tell Cornelius words whereby thou and thy house might be saved. Now faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. We know that. Now, Mr. Morey says that Cornelius had been listening to Peter all this time and that was what caused him to believe and be saved and then the Holy Spirit fell on him. But what really happened? What really happened? Look at this. In Acts 11 and verse 4, stay with me here. Acts 11 and verse 4, Listen to what Peter says. Now, Peter, Peter is back giving a report to all the brethren about what happened. And he says, Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning and expounded it by order unto them. He's telling the things that happened in order. And he says, he was in Joppa and he was praying. God tells him to go and he winds up at Cornelius' house. Now, let's come back down to verse 15 now. Now, uh, he's speaking. He gets to Cornelius' house and look at what happens. Remember, this is all in order. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them as on us at the beginning. Now, friends, let's reason together. If faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, how was it that Cornelius believed and was saved. If Peter has just begun to be speaking the words whereby they must be saved. See, they want Peter, they want Cornelius, Mr. Moore and Mr. Hopkins and all, all these ba all the Baptist preachers out here, they want, they want Cornelius so desperately to be saved before baptism that they actually have him saved really before he hears the words whereby he must be saved. Peter says, I begin to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them. See, now they're going to say, they want to say, well, the Holy Ghost fell on them, therefore they must be saved. That's not what the Bible says. Out of your own mouth, Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Cornelius has not yet heard the words whereby he must be saved. And by Mr. Morris' own admission, Cornelius was not a saved man, even though he was a good Joe. He wasn't saved. And here, as Peter begins to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them, and he hasn't even heard the words enough to believe. Now, I don't know where you get he believed in that. He just barely heard the words. He just barely started hearing words that Peter was speaking. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them as on us beginning. The reason the Holy Spirit fell on Cornelius and those there with him was not because he was saved. It had nothing to do with him believing. It had nothing to do with him having repented. It had everything to do with proving to Peter and those six brethren that were with him. Look, Acts 11 verse 12. There were six brethren that accompanied Peter. So seven Jews were in the house of a Gentile and they're all seriously still wondering, am I really supposed to be here preaching the gospel? Because the first thing Peter said to Cornelius in Acts 10 and verse 28 was this. Now watch it. He said, ye know how that it is unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or to come unto one of another nation. But God had showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Well, he showed it to him, Peter, but do you really, did you really get the message? 
Apparently not because God's going to demonstrate that the Gentiles are going to get the gospel that the Jews got. They get the same gospel, Romans 1.16, the gospel is to everyone to believe it, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It was to all people, and Peter and those other six Jews need to demonstrate it, need a demonstration that it was indeed God's will that these people be saved. And so the Holy Spirit fell on Cornelius as Peter began to speak. Cornelius didn't have time to hear the words where he must be saved, even, even if he was saved by faith only. He didn't even have time to hear the words to believe. So, it wasn't that he was saved before baptism. It wasn't that he got the Holy Spirit and therefore he was saved. It was a demonstration to the unbelieving Jews that this was God's will. 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, um, I see here. 1 Corinthians 14.22. Tongues are for a sign not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. And the unbelievers in Acts 10 were not Cornelius. It was Peter and those other six. And what they didn't believe was that the Gentiles should get the gospel. And so as Peter began to speak, as he began the sermon, the people that he came to tell the words whereby they must be saved, the Holy Spirit fell on the audience as a demonstration to the six guys and Peter, yeah, this is, this is God's will. Now, they try, they're trying to get this before baptism so they can say, oh, he was saved. No, friends, that's not what it proves. What proves too much proves nothing. All that proved was that if you want to say Peter, uh, Cornelius was saved if you want to say Cornelius was saved before uh, he was baptized, you're going to have to say yes. You're going to have to say he was saved. Uh, uh, you're going to have to say he had the Holy Spirit before he even believed. See that? Now, he's going to ask this question. I, I'm out of time. I'm out of time. Listen, friends, I, I'd like to continue this a little more. It's an excellent question. Was Cornelius a child of God or a child of the devil when he spoke in tongues? You know what, friends? That doesn't prove anything. I said the child of the devil. By his own admission, he, he was a sinner. By his own admission, Cornelius was not saved. And I've already demonstrated to him that the Holy Spirit fell on him before he even believed. He just heard the words. where He hadn't even begun to hear the words whereby he must be saved. So, no, he wasn't a child of God when the Holy Spirit fell on him. He wasn't a child of God when he began to speak in tongues. I don't have a problem saying that at all. Now, Mr. Hopkins, you want to write another letter? I'd be glad to read it. I'd be glad if you'd call in. I'd be glad if you came on if you wanted to come on. I'd be glad to talk to Dr. Robert Moore if he wanted to, if you could get him on. I don't think he can. Uh... I think he likes to talk big, but I don't think he would come. But friends, you know the fact of the matter is, $1,000 are still out there. If you could just find, if you could just find all these false doctrines in the Bible, you'd, ha you'd, have, you'd have a shot at it. But until next time, but until then, friends, we're just going to keep tearing them apart. Friends, remember to stay tuned for Religious Review, 1030 after the news. We've got a special uh, a program coming up from uh, uh, Michigan. Going to show you some of their TV programs, let you watch what's going on. So stay tuned after the news. We'll be right back with Religious Review. MDV, glad to have you 